every single thing that needs to be done in my business lives in ClickUp. One of the ways I explain what I do is that I, I help people cr turn ClickUp into their business instruction manual. And I would say that for myself, that's very much what's happening in ClickUp. It's where we're doing our weekly scrums. It's where we're keeping track of all of our processes. But most importantly, every single task that's in there, whether it's one time or recurring, it has a process attached to it. And if it doesn't have a process, it has a task saying create the process for it. What happens when you fully commit to something in your business? When you are completely, totally, 100% all in? I'm Susan Bowles, and you're listening to Break the Ceiling, the show where we break down unconventional strategies you can use to save time, boost your profit, and increase your operational capacity. On the last few shows, we've been talking about no-code tools and the different ways you can use them in your business to streamline and automate internal processes and enhance your communication with your clients. You can use no-code tools to build digital products, help your students learn more effectively, and to diversify your revenue streams. Some of the no-code tools out there are so flexible and capable that you can actually run your entire business pretty much end to end on them. Today, I'm gonna to talk to Layla Pomper, the founder of Process Driven. You might recognize Layla from the Notion versus ClickUp episode earlier this year. Well, Layla is all in with ClickUp, which is an extremely flexible, no code project management platform that we both use in our businesses. But Layla has taken her commitment to ClickUp to the next level. She uses it to bring in new clients by using it as her opt-in and the topic of her YouTube channel. She uses it to communicate and manage her one-on-one -on -one clients. She uses it to manage her own team and all of Process Driven's operations. She even now has a small group learning program all about how to use ClickUp more effectively. She went all in. And it's paid big dividends for her business and her clients. Layla and I are gonna get into all the details about how she's using ClickUp everywhere in her business, the impact she's seen, and how to get the most out of the no-code tools that you're using in your business. Hey, Layla, thanks for uh, coming back to the show. Thanks for having me, I'm excited. Yeah, I think this is gonna be really fun, and I know both of us really love geeking out on ClickUp, so, <laughs> um, so here we go. So you have really gone all in on kind of a single no-code tool for your business, ClickUp, which is one of our favorite softwares, mm -hmm. and you are, you're using that in a lot of different ways. So kind of give me the high-level overview of all of the different places you're using it, and then we could talk about the specific details of each area. Ooh, okay. Um, so I was thinking about this question and you know how the whole phrase like the cobbler's kid has no shoes. I'm like the cobbler's kid that has like a whole shoe collection. <laughs> so <laughs> I, love I that. and I feel uh, every bit of that. <laughs> I use ClickUp for so many things that I wouldn't necessarily recommend using it for just because I want to experiment. So I just want to put that disclaimer out there. But right now I'm using ClickUp for an opt-in. So I have free ClickUp stuff as an opt-in. I use ClickUp as the topic for my YouTube channel. A lot of the, the videos that come out, I use ClickUp to manage my clients. I use ClickUp as a makeshift CRM. I use ClickUp for my SOPs and processes. I use ClickUp for team management and onboarding and training. I use ClickUp for the actual topic of my online course. So I'm teaching people how to use ClickUp. I also use ClickUp as the kind of client portal or service delivery method for my clients who are actually doing ClickUp implementation with me. Uh, and I probably use it for, oh, I also use it for personal life. So we are renovating our house. And so ClickUp is managing our home renovation. Uh, ClickUp is also managing my household routines. I'm sure I'm missing some. But I'm using a lot of things with ClickUp. <laughs> but your life basically exists on ClickUp. If it if ClickUp doesn't hold it, you're not doing it. <laughs> Most likely, yeah. If ClickUp doesn't tell me to do it, I'm not going to even remember where it's at. Yeah, I have a very similar uh, strategy with ClickUp where every, <laughs> everything's in there. And if it's not in there, it's not going to happen. Yeah. And I should be clear, like I am managing everything in ClickUp. I still have outside databases that I use because I, I just think ClickUp gets a little slow for that. So like I might sometimes have a task that says go to X database and work on stuff, but it's all being managed in ClickUp. Okay. So let's kind of start at the beginning of that customer process. You said you're using ClickUp templates as lead magnets, as opt-ins. 
and also kind of as the main topic for your YouTube channel. So talk to me a little bit about how you're using ClickUp in your marketing. Yeah, so I think um, my business is kind of, it's very much got a process focus. And so process lends itself really well to checklists. And even before I started specializing in working with people who were also using ClickUp, I was talking about, you know, here's a process for this, here's a process for that. And so when it came to opt-ins, my natural inclination was, oh, a great opt-in would be a checklist for this or a process for that, you know, that kind of thing. And when I narrowed it down to working just with ClickUp users, life became a lot easier because I could just take a template that I had already created either for internal use or to give to clients. And then I just kind of polished it up a little bit, made sure there weren't any typos, and I published it to my website as an opt-in. Um, and when it came to the YouTube videos, very similar story. I was creating ClickUp-based assets for my clients um, or for my team where we needed to do something. And at a certain point, I was like, oh, well, if I just kind of censor this a little bit, I can just publish it to the whole world. And that's pretty much the whole story behind how my YouTube channel got started. Yeah, and I... I send people to your YouTube channel all the time because everybody's oh, asking me questions and I'm like, no, I don't want to answer that. I'm pretty sure Layla already did just go, just go watch her YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> that is very much the intent because you, you find when you're starting to work with the same tools, the same questions are asked again and again. And so I, I'm not great with the long emails. So having a short video link, much better. Yeah. And I personally, I love having it as a resource to point people to because then I don't have to do it. <laughs> I actually just created it for you, Susan. I know. I really appreciate it. It's really helped me out. <laughs> uh, so you are also using ClickUp as kind of a value add in your one-on-one -on -one services. Talk to me a little bit about how you use ClickUp with your one-on-one -on -one clients. Oh my gosh. Um, everything, everything lives in ClickUp for me. And I think there's so many different angles I could take on this. At the beginning, when I was still working with a variety of tools, I used ClickUp as kind of our client portal, client communication method. I know some people use Slack or Trello boards or email and email and email. Um, I was using ClickUp very early. And I mean, that has its own challenges because ClickUp isn't always the easiest tool for guests. But I was using ClickUp to just kind of manage the whole service process. So we'd have dashboards to kind of manage the project. We'd be chatting directly through ClickUp. And basically the boundary that was set pretty early on is that I'm terrible at email, please use ClickUp. And so um, I was amazed by when I really clearly articulated that, that boundary, clients started using ClickUp and they found that, wow, it's so much faster to be able to chat and send video clips back and forth. And now that's the main way I you know, manage our projects between meetings and sessions and also handling support is all through that ClickUp, um, kind of ClickUp chat. So talk to me a little bit more about how you, how you got people to buy into that, you know? So you set these really firm boundaries. Did you do training for them as they came on board? Like what did the process look like to transition folks and their primary discussions from email and meetings into ClickUp? Because I think this is a piece that a lot of, um, a lot of folks don't necessarily think about using their project management tool in that way mm -hmm. and it's one of my very favorite uses of the project management tool especially if you are working remotely to be mm -hmm. able to have the whole conversation in one place um, and that makes sense to people with teams but I think sometimes it does not make sense to people working with clients that way so can you talk to me a little bit about how you kind of evolved into that yeah it's been an interesting journey. So at first, it was very much just reminding them and reminding them and reminding them. Sheer force of will is what got people out of my inbox and out of, you know, even phone calls at times where people just really needed to be trained. Um, how I got them comfortable using ClickUp, I mean, I'm fortunate in that ClickUp training is now a big part of what I do. So I was kind of I kind of had some skills in this area, um, but at first, the way I handled it was kind of a video tour, which I'm sure you're familiar with. The idea of kind of a loom talk through of here's where you go for this and here's where you go for that. And at first, I was giving people very simplified areas. They were guests in my ClickUp account with very simplistic views. They saw one list, one dashboard, and that's it. Um, in that dashboard area, we also had some kind of collective resources that all clients had access to. So it really was this kind of almost course-like um, kind of vault of resources and then your own private work area. The way I got people to actually use it was persistence, I think. Uh, we would, you know, 
<laughs> we would message through the chat in there. I'd even be sending tips on how to use ClickUp throughout our project. Um, so naturally, after doing that for a while, it made sense to start specializing in the actual setup of ClickUp as the project because we were doing so much ClickUp training anyway. Um, I guess to better answer your actual question about the digital collaboration piece, I'm we're just wrapping up now a larger project with a larger team. And the way that project is running is that we have, you know, sessions every other week to kind of work on different things that need to be discussed in person. But between the sessions, all of the work, all of the iteration, all of the tailoring of pieces of the ClickUp puzzle, because as you know, it's very personal to one person. <laughs> um, you know, each person can see something different. And we're doing that entirely through the chat and collaboration features. And when we first, when I announced that at one of the first sessions, I said, all right, guys, we'll be seeing you in two weeks. But it, between now and then, you know, the whole spiel. And some someone, actually the, the tech person spoke up and said, I don't know if we can do that. I think we might need to schedule a meeting for next week because I don't know if we can handle uh, just chatting about this. And I said, oh, just you wait and see. <laughs> and and uh, I won him over eventually. But I think that just doing it helps people see, oh, wow, sending video clips and sending chat, like that does work. That is communication. It's just different than what we might be used to. Yeah, and I think it's a it is a way of communicating that if you can embrace it can really be very powerful in uh, a remote environment where you're trying to make things happen asynchronously. Maybe you're in different time zones, stuff is happening, your yep. team is all working at different times. Um, it's I, I've just seen it be such a game changer for internal and external communication. So I love that um, that's just a big part of your one on one services. Yeah, and I would add to that. Um, sometimes moving to async is really helped by using something like ClickUp because I've had a lot of teams who are meeting crazy and then they go to work remote because of COVID or something else and getting them into like a ClickUp dashboard where people each post their update every week into a chat widget that they all share with a shared template that basically mirrors a scrum template. I mean, all of a sudden we're making this kind of, we're replacing the need for a 30 minute scrum by having a chat widget. It's just, it's really convenient for the teams, like you said, that are working in different time zones or, you know, have life going on uh, yeah. or don't want to be <laughs> on more Zoom thing. calls. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? You, you have no idea. No, I love that. Okay, so we've done marketing one on one. And now you're creating this whole community group learning experience around helping folks use ClickUp. So how did that evolve? And how are you actually using ClickUp there? Yeah, so um, I think it's a natural progression of where I went with YouTube. So a year ago, I was exclusively doing one on one services. I was no diversification at all, <laughs> process driven. And um, I started putting things on YouTube because I was like, well, if I post it on YouTube, I can send the link to future clients and not have to, you know, I wasn't worried about SEO, any of that. Just I don't want to answer these questions again. Um, and after doing that for a while, well, YouTube's channel started to pick up and I got a lot of emails coming in from people who just wanted almost like a just a roadmap for how to navigate the YouTube videos. So I made a mm. playlist. But they wanted more than that because they're like, well, I'm just, you know, this particular problem is what I'm trying to solve. It's about collaboration. It's, you know, and you hear enough of those things and you kind of see the lines connecting them. And eventually I realized, huh, if I really want to put more energy behind this, I can't exclusively do this in the evenings after my one-on-one -on -one client work. So I started uh, thinking about how to make it more of an actual content offer. And the community came up because I realized that the best way to learn ClickUp is by using it and asking questions. It's, as you've probably experienced, it's a really iterative process. It's really, you know, curiosity driven. And that's at least how I implement it even. It's not like we're going to set it up correctly and you'll never touch it again. <laughs> it's... <laughs> You know, you, you learn by seeing how other people are doing it and say, oh, that's cool. I'm going to steal that little piece and change a little, you know, whatever. So I really wanted to have something where people were interacting, not just with me, but they also had a roadmap or a path that they could follow. So they didn't feel like they were just going down the YouTube rabbit holes. And so uh, clicking up, yeah, started. And uh, the name clicking up is kind of speaking to that whole iteration, like click up is a verb. I'm not as good at naming as you are, Susan. So I couldn't be that creative. <laughs> I'm awful at naming. I hate naming things. They're oh, so I totally awful. disagree. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's always such a, just such a horrible, like internal process where you're just like, I don't, I have no idea what to name this thing. So I think you are perfect at naming things. Yeah, ING. That was as creative as I could get. So I was like, I'm going to, you know, gerund this baby. And <laughs> and that's what, I, that's what I actually just released it. It just went live yesterday after pre-selling and all that 
we had a whole wait list to kind of prove it was a good idea, pre-sell to make sure, like, again, people were interested. And then it just went live yesterday. So I'm kind of, um, at the time of filming here, I'm just really I'm excited. I'm, people are now just getting into it. I'm getting the feedback. And it's it's an exciting, it's an exciting week. Yeah, I think it's super cool. So we've done client stuff, marketing, and you're also using ClickUp internally as kind of the main hub of process-driven operations, your your operations. So talk to me a little bit about how you use process driven to manage internal operations, manage your team, manage your own stuff. Yeah. So actually, and I should back up first to answer. I realized I never answered your last question. I actually originally was going to launch clicking up using ClickUp as the delivery platform. And I just want to clarify the fact that I ended up, I tried it and it was so crazy collaborative that I was like, this is never going to work. Actually, my my one-on-one services for a time actually had a course-like framework as the back-end kind of support of the one-on-one service. It was just so crazy. Um, So we ended up moving away from it into Member Vault, just to give you the tech stack on that one. It is so interesting because I also thought about running my group program inside ClickUp. Um, Mm -hmm. And yeah, I was just like, I can't like... It's the iteration was to, so hard. Yeah, yes. Like I needed a structure around the mm-hmm. the curriculum and that, yeah, it needed to be a little, I don't even like saying less collaborative, but it needed to be yeah. a little bit less collaborative, a little bit more structured. Um, yeah, I love I janky setups, have... but that was too janky. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you also, I think, may have won me over on Member Vault. I've been going back and forth oh. on course platforms, and I think, I think... I I love them. (laughs) Yeah. Member Vault has impressed me so much in the actual team and the community. Their Facebook group is, you know, it is par none. It is absolutely, um, I mean, the platform itself, not the most beautiful, but I really liked it because it had a one-click login link that you could create so people didn't need to remember a password and email. And Mm. that link could then be embedded into ClickUp. So, you know, bringing it all back. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I think so, I've been going back and forth and I I just like the functionality and the flexibility of how mm-hmm. you can interact with the people in your courses. And I think that is really unusual. Most of the course platforms are like, you can load this resource and then mm-hmm. they have to move through the course this way. And I like that Member Vault is really flexible and like how you can interact with the people going through your courses to make it more interactive. Yeah, so I, it's really okay. nice, and I'm sorry I completely derailed from your actual question. <laughs> I mean, we're I talking about no happen. code. This is, you know, it's a no code platform that we're using. That um, actually, I think very few people are talking about because it's kind of, it's kind of new. Um, it is, and it's a little bit of a, a dark horse in the course platform community. Uh, yeah, it doesn't seem to have a lot of funding behind it, so there just seem to be quieter. But once you're plugged in, it's like, oh wow. <laughs> Mm -hmm. How did I not know? It feels like a mom and pop course platform. And I don't even know if that, I didn't know that that was a possible thing, but it's a thing. (laughs) It's a thing. Um, Okay. So your actual question was what? (laughs) Was talking about how you're using ClickUp internally um, as Mm. kind of your main hub of internal operations. Yeah. So every single thing that needs to be done in my business lives in ClickUp. ClickUp, I know we've talked about before, I think back in the last episode where I was on with uh, Marie is like, ClickUp is the place where process can live. It One of the catchphrases or kind of ways I explain what I do is that I, I help people cr- turn ClickUp into their business instruction manual. And I would say that for myself, that's very much, you know, what's happening in ClickUp. It's where we're doing our weekly scrums or our meetings where we're keeping track of all of our processes but most importantly every single task that's in there whether it's one time or recurring it has a process attached to it and if it doesn't have a process it has a task saying create the process for it um but that is my app i know no one likes documentation but it's one of my absolute favorite things to do so i know it sounds weird but this morning i was just working on you know documenting the process for these email reminders that we have going out for office hours that happen in clicking up and i was like documenting the process of doing it. And I was just like, this is so great. And I just attach that SOP onto the task, make it recur, and then I can delegate it. And that's really, that's what ClickUp is to me. And I think that's the best use case for ClickUp. Mm, I love that. Is it worth it? Every small business owner wants to know that the money they spend on their businesses is worth it. That their investments produce results and help them grow. 
but if you don't know your business finances in and out, it's hard to know whether those expenses and investments are really worth it. Plenty of business owners, even the successful ones, feel like they're shooting in the dark when it comes to how they spend, save, and invest their money. Like you, they wonder if the ads they're buying, the software they're investing in, or the people they're paying are really paying off. And that's stressful. Feeling unsure about how you're spending or investing your money might be common, but it sure isn't fun. I want something different for you. I want you to feel confident that every decision you make is guided by your financial intel. I want you to be able to decide what actions to take to grow your business from a place of confidence and purpose, not panic, so that you can feel masterful at managing your money instead of inept or just plain scared. I want you to know exactly what's working so you can go all in and make your money make more money. This is what I do for business owners when I step in as their chief financial officer on demand. I help them parse the numbers, look for opportunities, and invest where it counts. We get clear on where they're getting in their own way and where the math just doesn't add up. And now I wanna teach you to do the same for your own business, because trust me, you can. Join me for Think Like a CFO. It's a four month accelerator, online workshop, and small group coaching program where I'll work alongside you so you can start thinking like a CFO and know that every penny you spend on your business is worth it. You'll dig into your relationship to money, put your financial data at your fingertips, and build systems of cash flow, taxes, and budgeting. I'll help you integrate your financial knowledge into your operational systems and technology so that your whole business works better. And by the end, you'll feel wildly capable with your money. Think Like a CFO is starting soon. So go to scalespark.co slash CFO to get all the information and sign up. I can't wait to work with you. So talk to me a little bit about the impact that going all in on this one no-code tool has had on your business. I mean, you're using it in so many different ways, but you really committed to say, this is a tool, it's very flexible, I can use it in a lot of different ways. How, how many different ways can I figure out how to use this? <laughs> and how can I go all in? So talk to me a little bit about the, the impact that's had on your business. Yeah, I think the reason I went all in, and I was resistant to it for years. I was using ClickUp internally, but I didn't want to, you know, be like the ClickUp person. Um, the reason I went all in was more so not even from an operations perspective, but just as an efficiency thing. I was keeping up on so many tools, and as you probably know, those rabbit mm -hmm. holes are deep and wide and and time consuming. <laughs> oh my gosh, so time consuming, and I just found that if I could just dig into one, my, what is it? I, I'm trying to remember the phrase. There's a TED talk. Okay. Sidetrack. There is a TED talk that um, I heard on the radio at some point, And it was talking about this woman who invents uh, useless things. Maybe you've seen her YouTube channel. I wish no. I knew her name. Oh, it's so fun. I heard another YouTube rabbit hole to go down, but she <laughs> opens up her talk by saying um, something along the lines of the best way to become the master in your field is to pick a very, very small field. Mm. And so um, I kind of took that approach to when it came to like process consulting. I figured if I could really narrow in on a certain type of vehicle, it would be a lot easier to master it, which is kind of just common sense. And surely enough, it has been. I would say that the narrowing really helped the most from a marketing and positioning perspective, because before that, I felt very general. But when you think about ClickUp and process or ClickUp and business instruction manual, we've narrowed it down so far that usually... Um, the people who come to me have a very clear idea of what I do, which was the biggest challenge for the first, you know, three-ish years. Yeah. Yeah. We've talked a little bit <laughs> behind the scenes about how difficult it is um, for folks who do systems mm -hmm. to translate that to something that not system people understand who's the right choice at a specific point. So all of us internally <laughs> who do very similar <laughs> things that are actually not at all the same thing seem very similar to people who are not in our brains <laughs> oh my gosh and it's so hard because you know i bet a lot of systems people could do click up stuff i'm sure i could set up you know member vault who knows 
but it's just trying to that position question it's you know it's separating capabilities from competencies and trying to really just you know own your area yeah and i mean on a with a platform like ClickUp where they're iterating so quickly and there's so many new features coming out every week and trying to stay up to date just on that one platform is a lot. Uh, much less trying to figure out all the different ways you could harness what they've just released because every time they come out <laughs> with something, I'm like, ah, I can think of 10 different ways I could use this. How am I gonna practice <laughs> all of those things and figure out if that might work there or over here? And uh, so, yeah, I could see where being really specific about the software that you are implementing and using and the ways that you're executing can um, be efficient internally and also a really solid marketing position. Cause yeah, you're now the, you're the ClickUp person where I'm like, hey, you need to learn ClickUp, you need to go talk to Layla cause. <laughs> <laughs> she's your person well i'm i'm so happy to hear that i i it was like one of those weird things because i was very lucky in that my timing lined up with ClickUp getting you know a round of investing which you probably or investment as you probably saw and just like things were moving in my favor i was like oh my gosh i went from like kind of no name systems person to like small name systems person <laughs> in very short order thanks to just you know the the way that the I'll just say the, the timing the cookie crumb yeah exactly well, and exactly. like their ability to share templates was a very like that oh. was really a game changer, I think, because if you can't like one of the things that was always frustrating for me as I do click up implementations is mm -hmm. how do I take all of the stuff that I've built and not have to then go rebuild it <laughs> other mm -hmm. places and being able to share that with people that, you know, when you when they ask a question and they're like, oh, how do you do this? You could just be like, oh, well, here, you can just have my. Just have my template. Like so just, true. It's easier so than true. me explaining it to you. Just here you go. Um, yeah, and well, I think until they had gotten to that point, like I think that was really that was really a challenge. Mm -hmm. And I think what's sometimes hard about that, though, which is like the flip side of public templates, is people overemphasize the importance of the templates or the mm -hmm. structure yeah, in general. For sure. <laughs> like we were talking about right before this, how you know your structure is really sophisticated and all this stuff, and trying to explain it took you know a while to talk through and give the tour of the logic behind it. And I think like one of the big things I've been emphasizing and clicking up, which I didn't realize was such a central belief for me, but you know when you start making a course, you're like become very self aware of your own, <laughs> yes, your own approach. <laughs> you know all too well what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I was really realizing that one of my, you know, cornerstones is the fact that people freak out about the importance of structure when really it's the strategy, which we've talked about before, your process and your strategy, which is way outside of the technology that actually matters. It does not matter that much, you know, what your list is and what your folder is and what your status is. We, we get so hung up on these things, but it's really, it adds like 20% of the value and the other 80% is just knowing what the heck you're doing to begin with. Yeah, I mean, I always like templates as a place to start or a place to see how somebody else's brain works. You know, before mm -hmm. we got on um, this call, we were talking about me trying to explain my click up to um, a new team member and the fact that I don't actually have anybody in semi click up really other than my podcast producer up to this point. And so it really is an extension of how my brain works. And that changes like because mm -hmm. there's nobody else in my ClickUp, I don't have any constraints on changing how my brain works. If they release a new feature, I can completely <laughs> change how everything's organized in there so that it matches how my brain thinks about things and how I want to plan out my strategy or my tasks because it doesn't, it doesn't impact anything. So um, and true. I think that's a really different way of using it than I would have to if I had, you know, regular team members that needed a more consistent structure. You know, I think there's a lot of interplay between the strategy that goes into a consensus model where everybody has mm. to kind of agree to how it's structured versus, you know, in my brain when I'm like, oh, I want to plan out something new or I've got a new project and I'm going to just reorder how everything <laughs> happens. Or a couple of weeks ago, Such I went in and added point. emojis to everything so that the the visual representation showed up differently. Um, and such trying a good to explain point. that to someone was really, <laughs> I sent her a 17 minute loom video and I was like, I'm sorry, this is so long. <laughs> you know that, but that's so, I think that's just what a great way of putting it because I never realized it until you said this, but when we're building a ClickUp for a team, that's the hardest thing is, is because oftentimes the business owner is championing it, or maybe it's the IT director, but most often it's the business owner with my size client. And there's such a force of will that that person brings in because they're used mm -hmm. to designing the entire business. 
that I, until you said that, I don't know if I would have been able to articulate it this way, but we almost need to like shake up the power structure and make make it a consensus build out. And oftentimes, yeah, that's that's just interesting. It It's one of those things that which is what makes project management tools, I would argue, the hardest type of tool to set up. Uh, absolutely. 100%. It is the hardest type of tool, especially on something flexible like ClickUp or Notion, mm. where there's not necessarily like a real, yes, there's a structure, but the way the structure is set up, you can use it in a million different ways. I think trying to figure out the best strategy to even start can sometimes really be the hurdle that keeps people from getting it set up. And I think that that is... That's the cool part about no code tools, but also kind of the intimidating factor is because so much of it is in the strategy. Um, and I always think it's interesting that when people are like, oh, you use ClickUp, can I see your ClickUp? I'm like, mm. yeah, but also it's not at all the way that I would think that you should set your, like, yes, I'll show yeah. you. But it is in no way the way that you should be using ClickUp or setting this up if you have, you know, you business owner with team of five, you might get some stuff out of how I'm using it and cool things that I've decided to implement, but that's going to be really different than how I implement ClickUp for clients or how, you know, Joe Schmo down the street should implement ClickUp for his <laughs> business. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah, I, yeah. It's funny, even if you're working with the same type of client, I know there's a lot of, you know, ClickUp specialists that are specializing in an industry right now, and they kind of have a way that they set it up, like, you know, more or less a space template. This is how your client should be organized. I find that so challenging because even in the same industry, a similar size business, depending on your strategy and how, like what you're trying to manage within ClickUp or maybe, you know, collecting, uh, it's like the difference between automating actions and automating instructions. But depending on yes. what you're putting in ClickUp, it's going to look entirely different. <laughs> I well, think I've built, you know, yeah. Yeah, like your values and what how your team mm -hmm. thinks and how you work with your team. Even if you're in this, I mean, you know, I worked with agencies. That's a pretty specific niche. And also every single one is very different. Absolutely. And it sounds like we're overcomplicating it. You know how like the person who like makes bread is like, there's so much to the science of it. And the rest of us are like, I just like bread. I'm sure there's people listening who are like, yeah, 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 it's just a task tool. But it really, I mean, you'll notice it as you start using it. If you peek inside someone else in your industry or a peer, that's what's so fun about the community is you can, you know, you literally see, peek. Yeah, you yeah. peek at people's brains. Like that's, you exactly. are seeing how people's brains work. Or their collective look at my brain. click up. Yeah, you see, you see exactly how my brain is thinking and what I care about right now. And, you know, what projects are overlapping and how my brain works like I like having emojis that mean things and colors <laughs> that mean things and yeah just the difference between a list and a task you know how spread out do you like to think about things that says a lot about mm -hmm. a person which I know clients hate when I say that but I'm like there's two ways to do it and they're like just tell me which one just tell <laughs> and me, eventually tell me what the best practice is like that is my old that is oh. my maybe my least favorite question but also the most common question is just yep. tell me what the best practice is and we'll just do that. Um, yep. And my answer is always like, well, it there isn't. <laughs> like that's the point is that there isn't a best practice and that it can be really flexible and really customized to how you get it. But I've also been like, for me, I've been customizing my ClickUp for two years. Yep. You know, it didn't start out that way. It started out as a list of things that I had to do. <laughs> Mm hmm. Which, which is where I think everyone just needs to start. Just use it as a nice to do list. And then everything kind of, I know it's a very like woo woo way of going, but just it organically follows from there. You're it like, does. Oh. It, yeah. it evolves. I had um, a few, you know, I received consults that come in. And whenever people say like, I want to set it up right the first time, I understand <laughs> why they say that. But it's such a red flag for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I am an iteration shop here. That's how you're going to end up liking what you get. Um, oh, it's so hard to see I'm, people. I'm who... the same, where I'm like, okay, <laughs> yes. So I now I come from a background of data. So mm -hmm. I come at it from kind of a different perspective, where I'm like, the data behind the scenes needs to be organized the quote unquote right way to be mm. able to answer the questions that you want to answer. So like when I'm doing financial data stuff, so true. Like I come to people's finances from a very different place than most accountants, because I'm saying, cool, how can we organize this to answer the questions we need it to answer? And in that sense, yeah, you totally need to be thinking about that when you are setting up 
your data structure so that you can report on it in a way that makes sense. Like that part of the setup, I, I'm like, yeah, you totally need to set it up the right way because if you don't collect data or you don't mm -hmm. think about the data and think about how you want to use the data on the, yeah. you know, six months from now when you want to answer the question about did this did this thing work or where are my clients coming from like you have to have set up the data structure to be able to answer those questions but like you i'm very iterative <laughs> so I'm like we'll yeah. we'll come up with that and start the structure the right way but also when i give you data and you start having reports all that does is prompt more questions that we then go add more data collection to answer Absolutely. more like it, it is it is an evolution and it always ends up being that. like i mean i've been doing business intelligence stuff for almost 20 years now like it always works that way mm -hmm. i give you a little bit of data and it prompts questions about okay now what about this so it's yeah. just it's always evolving and yeah i i i feel you <laughs> such <laughs> Sorry, I, mean... I went on a data rant <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it's so true, though, because I think that's been my big, again, like, I think you said it so much better than I could, but just the idea of, like, going in with the expectation that the first draft is not going to be perfect. I think there's a false assumption that ClickUp is like web design, <laughs> where it's like, I just want it to be beautiful, and mm -hmm. I can just hand it to somebody, and it'll come back beautiful, and I'll get more clients because of it. But that's not how it works, because... I mean, that's like not said, how web it, design works either. <laughs> I guess, that's true. I guess there's iteration to that as well, but I, I like is. to think that web design you could outsource it and it doesn't really involve as much of your brain as there's maybe for I'm sure simplifying web design but you know what I i'm mean, saying where ClickUp is yes, like getting your brain out of your brain for maybe the first time versus oh web God, design is so like hard more outside like there's, of yourself there is an emotional side for business owners that are doing it this first time where it's the mm -hmm. first time they've really had to um, when you are implementing a project management tool which is why i think it's probably one of the hardest ones to set up is that this is the first time where you have had to try and explain to somebody how your brain works and that yeah, is a your really business. difficult process like to to get outside of your brain to observe what your decision making process is and then be able to not just observe it but explain that to somebody in a way that they understand it and that other people mm -hmm. can then use your decisions use your brain man mm -hmm. that's there's a lot of emotions <laughs> tied to that for business owners oh my gosh and i i feel like two tools that have helped just in case anyone's listening is also in the same industry as you know doing this kind of work two things that have helped me on that front is one process mapping as an art not a science uh, i know mm. i think you also do it a little bit of this like just kind of building out the structure of things visually oh yes. my gosh it ha oh, like, i could not i can't yes. it has to be like a mind mappy kind yep. of Thing. I can't so I can't good. do system design where people are like, oh, just list this thing and list this thing. I'm like, no, I have to I have to see. I have to see the connections. Yep. Absolutely. And that is, I mean, I use that for business workflows, but also just the things that they're keeping track of. Like each process before it goes into ClickUp, it is a map. Because otherwise, you know, it's funny, I have them create the map as prep work a lot of the time and we'll come together to talk through it. And each time I have questions like, you know, you just jump from this step to this step. And they're like, oh, yeah, I forgot. We do these 15 things in between yes. them. <laughs> because like you get so used to following the same path, you mm -hmm. know, because even if you don't think yeah. you have a process, you do. Like yep. no matter what, there's habit. something in your brain that says, here's the next thing that I do. But trying to observe that is such a challenge. And it does mm -hmm. take somebody else going, well, that doesn't make any sense for you to be like, <laughs> oh, you're right. It, yeah, it doesn't. <laughs> There's other stuff happening there. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's one of the biggest reasons I've moved away from doing like quick implementations of things because it takes that time and repetition. That was actually going to say that that's the really the second thing that's helped cement this kind of iterative approach is in my project plans even, which we usually use ClickUp, go figure, to manage the actual project <laughs> steps. I list out that this is when we're going to do the first draft. Like I treat it more like a creative asset where we have got draft mm. one, revision one, draft two, you know, that kind of thing. I um, love that approach. I think that helps. Yeah, it changes the mindset from thinking that this is like a custom development that's going to be right the first time to, oh, this is a process. Go figure. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love that approach because to me, and I think we approach this very similarly, like there is an art to this. Like mm -hmm. this is this is 
the way we are creative is with systems and system design and process design. And yep. a lot of people don't think about it that way, but it's it's an art. So I love the idea of really leaning into that in just saying that like this is the this is a draft. This is this is art that we are creating together together through this process. Yeah, it sounds so hippy dippy, but <laughs> I watch but a lot of like it's not wrong. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's it's so collaborative. And like, I think that ties into the human element, which is probably the hardest part of all this and why project management is so hard is that external brain. But you've got all of these humans who you have to keep on the same page. You have to help them feel like their voice is being heard and like the Leviathan that you're building. And I think um, framing it as a creative, collaborative, artistic thing, I mean, that's just that's the part that I love, but also the part that I think a lot of folks, when they're looking from the outside at the work that you and I do, like systems folks seem dry and technical and yes, raw, you know, yes, no binaries, when really it's this creative endeavor. Yes, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> so is there anything you think we should talk about that we haven't touched on yet? I know we could talk about ClickUp for weeks at a time. Days. <laughs> <laughs> weeks. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think. I guess some, hmm, I guess the biggest things that I've been, you know, pondering for myself lately is thinking about, you know, the imperfections of no code. Uh, I think we glorify no code as like, wow, it's so much easier. It's so much more accessible. But with it, we are so limited in some ways by the choices of developers that we can't really mm. have access to. Yes. I think that's been something that I've been running into, especially with larger teams who are going through implementations. They, you know, they're like, why doesn't this work? And I'm like, well, it's just not an option that's available in the drop down, you know, that kind of stuff. Yes. I have, I, I love that perspective. Right before we were talking about how I really want to use um, the integrations to be able to customize custom fields in ClickUp, to be mm. able to enter data in there. And it's just, it's not an option that exists in Zapier yet. You know, it, a lot of these things, if you're patient enough, maybe it'll come. But there is that inherent limitation of the choices that people are making that aren't using the software the same way you are or aren't trying to use so the true. software the same way you are. And um, I think we talked about this in the last episode about how ClickUp is great. And also, it's not designed for service businesses necessarily because the people that are developing it are developing it and thinking like a software company so that they is, think yep. in sprints and you know so the sprint feature was one that they were really you know really excited about and one like getting the what is it the github integration mm -hmm. for to make their work easier and they are going to prioritize choice design and development choices that make their work easier not necessarily thinking about how you as an individual want to use the software and it'll probably come eventually but it's not a priority for them so true and that's what's hard about no code that is general and not n you know niche down by industry is because we have that by if there's no niching by industry i think across the board you pretty much see everything specializing to serve the company that's creating it so whatever right. that story is um whether it's they're a web designer who started this web design SaaS tool well everything is tailored you know with that with that bias and if you look at like ClickUp's team you know i do a lot of stalking of ClickUp just to you know <laughs> keep up on what's happening um like the team that they have the team members even that are coming into the product team they've got you know they've been working at SaaS companies their entire careers so what is that gonna what perspective is that gonna bring to waiting which issues get chosen mm, mm -hmm. you know that that's going to play an important role. And I think we can we can be loud and outspoken and ClickUp particularly does a nice job with their candy board to allow you to kind of vote on features. But I think that loss of control can be really a hard adjustment. It's kind of like the Android versus iPhone thing, not being able to you know change the you know SD card or whatever it might be. Um, ClickUp and no code tools in general, you're kind of, it's a closed box in some ways that give you limited functionality in these certain use cases that we can kind of build and expand on by being creative, but it's a different kind of creativity than creating something from scratch. And I think that's something hard for people to adjust to, especially if they're used to having things, you know, custom developed for them in a coded environment. Yeah, and absolutely, there's a there's a real trade off there, you know, you're paying a lot less to access really functional software, you know, you don't have mm -hmm. to pay to do the custom development, but you are limited by choices that people who are not you are making <laughs> about what you can do. And it's, 
it is so interesting to watch the biases and it's one of the reasons that when um when I talk about how I evaluate software, I evaluate whether or not a software tool has a public roadmap or, you know, mm -hmm. is do they allow their users to vote on features and talk about how they're using it and are they responsive to that? And is their customer service responsive? Because a lot of that has to, it has a big impact on how that how you can interact with that tool and how much you'll like the tool how much your users will like the tool and i think a lot of that has to do with those constraints and being able to operate within them or be patient enough for them to develop whatever it is that you need yeah especially if you're among the like the minority in terms of who you know if you're the only roofer using clickup you're probably gonna be you know screaming or working at an uphill battle to try to get your mobile the mobile app improved but mm -hmm. you know, it's just like hoping there's a big enough demographic that's pushing for the change that you're looking for to make you know the folks in the development wing able to hear you which probably ties in a lot to some of the broader conversations we're having about big tech right now <laughs> Yeah, for for sure <laughs> just just that little little nugget there <laughs> uh, oh i think that's a perfect place to wrap up so where can our listeners find you if they want to connect or learn more about what you do or about ClickUp? yeah yeah or about click up i ClickUp? the best place to find me is probably on youtube so you can look up my name layla pomper on youtube and you will see a ton of youtube tutorials uh, i also have a facebook group if you're more of a facebooker and my website is processdriven.co so you can find all that stuff probably on that website and it'll take you to the right spot awesome thanks so much for being <laughs> here layla i always love it when we get to just geek out especially about something that we both love so much <laughs> Likewise, Susan, thanks so much for having me. Over the course of this series on no-code software tools, we've covered a lot of different ways you could conceivably use these tools to make your business better. You can use them to streamline your workflow, enhance your client communication, and build that relationship. You can use them to help your students learn more effectively. Building no-code products or resources can diversify your income. You can even use them as marketing tools, as operations manuals, and as the foundation of your business operations. No-code software tools make it easier and cheaper than it's ever been to run a really effective, lean, profitable business. It's the way Layla and I both run pretty big businesses with pretty small teams and at a low cost. If there was one thing I had to point to in companies that routinely punch above their weight when it comes to revenue versus expenses, it's that they're really effectively using their resources. And most often that comes from understanding and harnessing technology like no-code tools effectively. Next week, we're kicking off a theme talking all about managing change, personally, professionally, and with your team. So hit subscribe in your favorite podcast player so you don't miss it. Break the Ceiling is produced by Yellow House Media. Our executive producer is Sean McMullen. Production coordinator is Lou Blazer. This episode is edited by Marty Seafeld with production assistance by Kristen Rundick.